The Treasure in the Forest by H. G. Wells The canoe was now approaching the land. The bay opened out, and a gap in the white surf of the reef marked where the little river ran out to the sea. The thicker and deeper green of the virgin forest showed its course down the distant hill slope. The forest here came close to the beach. Far beyond, dim and almost cloud-like in texture, rose the mountains, like suddenly frozen waves. The sea was still save for an imperceptible swell. The sky blazed. The man with the carved paddle stopped. It should be somewhere here, he said. He shipped the paddle and held his arms out straight before him. The other man had been in the forepart of the canoe, closely scrutinizing the land. He had a sheet of yellow paper on his knee. "'Come and look at this, Evans,' he said. Both men spoke in low tones, and their lips were hard and dry. The man called Evans came swaying along the canoe until he could look over his companion's shoulder. The paper had the appearance of a rough map. By much folding it was creased and worn to the pitch of separation, and the second man held the discolored fragments together where they had parted. On it one could dimly make out, in almost obliterated pencil, the outline of the bay. "'Here,' said Evans, "'is the reef, and here is the gap.' He ran his thumbnail over the chart. "'This curved and twisting line is the river. I could do with a drink now, and this star is the place.' "'You see the dotted line,' said the man with the map. It is a straight line and runs from the opening of the reef to a clump of palm trees. The star comes just where it cuts the river. We must mark the place as we go into the lagoon. It's queer, said Evans, after a pause, what these little marks down here are for. It looks like the plan of a house or something, but what all these little dashes pointing this way and that may mean I can't get a notion. And what's the writing? Chinese, said the man with the map. Of course. He was a Chinese, said Evans. Well, they all were, said the man with the map. They both sat for some minutes staring at the land while the canoe slowly drifted. Then Evans looked toward the paddle. Your turn with the paddle now, Hooker, said he. And his companion quietly folded up his map put it in his pocket, passed Evans carefully, and began to paddle. His movements were languid, like those of a man whose strength was nearly exhausted. Evans sat with his eyes half-closed, watching the frothy breakwater of the coral creep nearer and nearer. The sky was like a furnace now, for the sun was near the zenith. Though they were so near the treasure, he did not feel the exultation he had anticipated. The intense excitement of the struggle for the plan and the long night voyage from the mainland in the unprovisioned canoe had, to use his own expression, taken it out of him. He tried to arouse himself by directing his mind to the ingots the Chinaman had spoken of, but it would not rest there. It came back headlong to the thought of sweet water rippling in the river and the almost unendurable dryness of his lips and throat. The rhythmic wash of the sea upon the reef was becoming audible now, and it had a pleasant sound in his ears. The water washed along the side of the canoe, and the paddle dripped between each stroke. Presently, he began to doze. He was still dimly conscious of the island, but a queer dream texture interwove with his sensations. Once again, it was the night when he and Hooker had hit upon the Chinaman's secret. He saw the moonlit trees, the little fire burning, and the black figures of the three Chinamen, silvered on one side by moonlight, and on the other glowing from the firelight, and heard them talking together in pidgin English, for they came from different provinces. Hooker had caught the drift of their talk first. He had motioned to him to listen. 
Fragments of the conversation were inaudible and fragments incomprehensible. A Spanish galleon from the Philippines hopelessly aground and its treasure buried against the day of return lay in the background of the story. A shipwrecked crew thinned by disease, a quarrel or so, and the needs of discipline, and at last taking their boats never to be heard of again. Then Chang Hai, only a year since, wandering ashore, had happened upon the ingots hidden for two hundred years, had deserted his junk, and reburied them with infinite toil, single-handed, but very safe. He laid great stress on the safety. It was a secret of his. Now he wanted help to return and exhume them. Presently the little map fluttered and the voices sank. A fine story for two stranded British rastrals to hear. Evan's dream shifted to the moment when he had Shanghai's pigtail in his hand. The life of a Chinaman is scarcely sacred like a European's. The cunning little face of Shanghai, first keen and furious like a startled snake, and then fearful, treacherous, and pitiful, became overwhelmingly prominent in the dream. At the end, Chang Hai had grinned, a most incomprehensible and startling grin. Abruptly, things became very unpleasant, as they will do at times in dreams. Chang Hai gibbered and threatened him. He saw in his dream heaps and heaps of gold, and Chang Hai intervening and struggling to hold him back from it. He took Chang Hai by the pigtail. Oh, how big the yellow brute was, and how he struggled and grinned. He kept growing bigger, too. Then the bright heaps of gold turned to a roaring furnace, and a vast devil, surprisingly like Chang Hai, but with a huge black tail, began to feed him with coals. They burnt his mouth horribly. Another devil was shouting his name. Evans! Evans, you sleepy fool! Or was it Hooker? He woke up. They were in the mouth of the lagoon. There are the three palm trees. It must be in line with that clump of bushes, said his companion. Mark that. If we go to those bushes and then strike into the bush in a straight line from here, we shall come to it when we come to the stream. They could see now where the mouth of the stream opened out. At the end of it, Evans revived. Hurry up, man, he said, or by heaven I shall have to drink seawater. He gnawed his hand and stared at the gleam of silver among the rocks and green tangle. Presently he turned almost fiercely upon Hooker. Give me the paddle, he said. So they reached the river mouth. A little way up, Hooker took some water in the hollow of his hand, tasted it, and spat it out. A little further he tried again. This will do, he said, and they began drinking eagerly. Curse this, said Avin suddenly. It's too slow. And leaning dangerously over the fore part of the canoe, he began to suck up the water with his lips. Presently, they made an end of drinking and, running the canoe into the little creek, were about to land among the thick growth that overhung the water. We shall have to scramble through this to the beach to find our bushes and get the line to that place, said Evans. We had better paddle round, said Hooker. So they pushed out again into the river and paddled back down it to the sea and along the shore to the place where the clump of bushes grew. Here they landed, pulled the light canoe far up the beach and then went up towards the edge of the jungle until they could see the opening of the reef and the bushes in a straight line. Evans had taken a native implement out of the canoe. It was L-shaped, and the transverse piece was armed with polished stone. Hooker carried the paddle. It is straight now in this direction, said he. We must push through this till we strike the stream. Then we must prospect. They pushed through a closed tangle of reeds, broad fronds, and young trees. And at first it was toilsome going, but very speedily the trees became larger, and the ground beneath them opened out. The blaze of the sunlight was replaced by insensible degrees by a cool shadow. The trees became, at last, vast pillars that rose up to a canopy of greenery far overhead. The trees became, at last, vast pillars that rose up to a canopy of greenery far overhead. 
Dim white flowers hung from their stems, and ropey creepers swung from tree to tree. The shadow deepened on the ground. Blotched fungi and red-brown incrustation became frequent. Evans shivered. It seems almost cold here after the blaze outside. Well, I hope we are keeping to the straight, said Hooker. Presently they saw, far ahead, a gap in the somber darkness where the white shafts of hot sunlight smote into the forest. There was also brilliant green undergrowth and colored flowers. Then they heard the rush of water. Here's the river. We should be close to it now, said Hooker. The vegetation was thick by the river bank. Great plants, as yet unnamed, grew among the roots of the big trees and spread rosettes of huge green fans towards the strip of sky. Many flowers and a creeper with shiny foliage clung to the exposed stems. On the water of the broad, quiet pool which the treasure-seekers now overlooked, there floated big oval leaves and a waxen pinkish-white flower not unlike a water lily. Further, as the river bent away from them, the water suddenly frothed and became noisy and rapid. Well, said Evans. We have swerved a little from the strait, said Hooker. This was to be expected. He turned and looked into the dim, cool shadows of the silent forest behind him. If we beat a little way up and down the stream, we should come to something. You said, began Evans, he said there was a heap of stones, said Hooker. The two men looked at each other for a moment. Let us try a little downstream first, said Evans. They advanced slowly, looking curiously about them. Suddenly, Evans stopped. What the devil is that? he said. Hooker followed his finger. Something blue, he said. It had come into view as they topped a gentle swell of the ground. Then he began to distinguish what it was. He advanced suddenly with hasty steps until the body that belonged to the limp hand and arm had become visible. His grip tightened on the implement he carried. The thing was the figure of a Chinaman lying on his face. The abandon of the pose was unmistakable. The two men drew close together and stood staring silently at the ominous dead body. It lay in a clear space among the trees. Nearby was a spade after the Chinese pattern, and further off lay a scattered heap of stones close to a freshly dug hole. "'Somebody has been here before,' said Hooker, clearing his throat. Then suddenly Evans began to swear and rave and stamp upon the ground. Hooker turned white but said nothing. He advanced towards the prostrate body. He saw the neck was puffed and purple and the hands and ankles swollen. Pah, he said, and suddenly turned away and went towards the excavation. He gave a cry of surprise. He shouted to Evans, who was following him slowly. You fool, it's all right here. It's here still. He then turned again and looked at the dead Chinaman and then again at the hole. Evans hurried to the hole. Already half exposed by the ill-fated wretch beside them lay a number of dull yellow bars. He bent down in the hole and, clearing off the soil with his bare hands, hastily pulled one of the heavy masses out. As he did so, a little thorn pricked his hand. He pulled the delicate spike out with his fingers and lifted the ingot. "'Only gold or lead could weigh like this,' he said exultantly. Hooker was still looking at the dead Chinaman, he was puzzled. He stole a march on his friends, he said at last. He came here alone, and some poisonous stake has killed him. I wonder how he found the place. Evan stood with the ingot in his hands. What did a dead Chinaman signify? We shall have to take the stuff to the mainland piecemeal and bury it there for a while. How shall we get it to the canoe? He took off his jacket and spread it on the ground and flung two or three ingots into it. Presently, he found that another little thorn had punctured his skin. "'This is as much as we can carry,' said he. Then suddenly, with a queer rush of irritation, "'What are you staring at?' Hooker turned to him. "'I can't stand him,' 
He nodded towards the corpse. It's like, it's so like rubbish, said Evans. All Chinamen are alike. Hooker looked into his face. I'm going to bury that anyhow before I lend a hand with this stuff. Don't be a fool, Hooker, said Evans. Let that mass of corruption bide. Hooker hesitated, and then his eye went carefully over the brown soil about them. It scares me somehow, he said. The thing is, said Evans, what to do with these ingots? Shall we rebury them over here, or take them across the strait in the canoe? Hooker thought. His puzzled gaze wandered among the tall tree trunks and up into the remote sunlit greenery overhead. He shivered again as his eye rested upon the blue figure of the Chinaman. He stared searchingly among the gray depths between the trees. "'What's come to you, Hooker?' said Evans. "'Have you lost your wits?' "'Let's get that gold out of this place anyhow,' said Hooker. He took the ends of the collar of the coat in his hands, and Evans took the opposite corners, and they lifted the mass. "'Which way?' said Evans. "'To the canoe.' "'It's queer,' said Evans, when they had advanced only a few steps. "'But my arms ache still without paddling.' "'Curse it,' he said. "'But they ache. I must rest.' They let the coat down. Evans' face was white, and little drops of sweat stood out upon his forehead. "'It's stuffy somehow in this forest.' Then, with an abrupt transition to unreasonable anger, "'What is the good of waiting here all the day? "'Lend me a hand, I say. "'You have done nothing but moon since we saw the dead Chinaman.' "'Hooker was looking steadfastly at his companion's face. "'He helped raise the coat bearing the ingots "'and then went forward perhaps a hundred yards in silence. "'Evans began to breathe heavily. "'Can't you speak?' he said. "'What's the matter with you?' said Hooker. Evans stumbled, and then, with a sudden curse, flung the coat from him. He stood for a moment, staring at Hooker, and then, with a groan, clutched at his own throat. "'Don't come near me,' he said, and went and leant against a tree. Then, in a steadier voice, "'I'll be better in a minute.' Presently, his grip upon the trunk loosened, and he slipped slowly down the stem of the tree until he was a crumpled heap at its foot. His hands were clenched convulsively. His face became distorted with pain. Hooker approached him. Don't touch me! Don't touch me! said Evans in a stifled voice. Put the gold back on the coat. Can't I do anything for you? said Hooker. Put the gold back on the coat. As Hooker handled the ingots, he felt a little prick on the ball of his thumb. He looked at his hand and saw a slender thorn, perhaps two inches in length. Evans gave an inarticulate cry and rolled over. Hooker's jaw dropped. He stared at the thorn for a moment with dilated eyes. Then he looked at Evans, who was now crumpled together on the floor, his back bending and straightening spasmodically. Then he looked through the pillars of the trees and network of creeper stems to where in the dim gray shadow the blue-clad body of the Chinaman was still indistinctly visible. He thought of the little dashes in the corner of the plan, and in a moment he understood. God help me, he said, for those thorns were similar to those the Dyaks poison and use in their blowing tubes. He understood now what Chang Hai's assurance of the safety of his treasure meant. He understood that grin now. Evans, he cried. But Evans was silent and motionless now, save for a horrible spasmodic twitching of his limbs. A profound silence brooded over the forest. Then Hooker began to suck furiously at the little pink spot on the ball of his thumb, sucking for dear life. Presently he felt a strange aching pain in his arms and shoulders, and his fingers seemed difficult to bend. Then he knew that sucking was no good. Abruptly he stopped, and sitting down by the pile of ingots, and resting his chin upon his hands and his elbows upon his knees, stared at the distorted but still stirring body of his companion. Chang Hai's grin came in his mind again. 
The dull pain spread towards his throat and grew slowly in intensity. Far above him, a faint breeze stirred the granary, and the white petals of some unknown flower came floating down through the gloom. 